and we're back. This is the Covered Your Podcast. Uh, happy fall, everybody. It's getting chilly in some parts of the country. And um, such a wonderful way to end the evening uh, here talking insurance with one of my favorite new people. We met online. I swiped right. Is that the right way? I have no swipe? idea. <laughs> I, I swiped the correct way so we became friends kate go. terry from surround insurance welcome to the coverage podcast thank you i'm excited to be here and you're one of my favorite insurance people nick so this is exciting we're you know we're gonna talk shop mm -hmm. today and um i'm was really looking forward to this conversation because you are i consider you a legacy insurance person mm -hmm. who thinks outside the box. And we're going to be thinking outside the box. This whole episode is about out of the box thinking. And what's I think what's the most exciting part about that is that 10 years from now, we'll look back at this sort of stage in insurance and realize it's like, this is when it happened. This is when people like Kate Terry and Surround Insurance kind of planted a flag and said, we're going to change the way things are done. That's what this episode is going to be about. So I'm looking forward to it. This is the messy adolescence of insurance, right? Like we're all overgrown limbs and awkwardness, but we'll get there, right? That's so funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, when my wife sees like um, those geese that have like, mm -hmm. they're part white and part yes. gray, she always calls them teenagers. Ah. Just all awkward looking and stuff. So, are, yeah. um, but I, I, I think we're a little bit more than that. So mm -hmm. let's consider this like uh, not the prom, but maybe the mm -hmm. formal. I you like and I will, will, will have a for, the formal conversation. So um, Kate, I start all of these by allowing my guests to have a little bit of a soapbox. So who is Kate Terry and what do you do? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so yes, I'm Kate Terry. I'm co-founder and COO at Surround Insurance. And what I am is a, a legacy insurance person, as Nick said, um, and I'm here because I think this is the best industry in the world, right? We get to stand with people at the worst moments in their lives, right? Like I have this thing about fairness. Like I want the world to be fair. I never grew out of that like five-year-old, but it's not fair, mom and dad, right? And I've kind of felt the entirety of my career that every day I come to work, I make life a little more fair. I can't control who might get into an accident, but I can put them back together afterwards. I can't control, you know, who might have uh, something happen, a fire in their, in their uh, place of work, but we can fix that, right? Like, so we really, it's a privilege to stand with people in those moments. Um, and so I spent mm, about 12 years uh, in traditional insurance, working my way up the ranks. Um, I'm product manager by training, um, love talking insurance products. Hope we get to do some more of that tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just kind of came to a point where, I just wanted to think a little bit differently. You know, there are a lot of highly ethical, well-run, large insurance companies, but the fact that they're so well-run and so large means that it is very difficult for them to decide to um, do something new or put, you know, five or 10 yep. or $20 million or however much it takes a large corporation uh, to do something entirely new when they could spend that same amount of money and improve the profitability of their massive workers' compensation book by 0.1% and it's a sure thing, right? Like you just end up in this divide where it's impossible to innovate because it costs you too much. Um, and that just, I kept butting my head up against that and sort of had enough. Um, so I, I left my corporate career like up and left, um, started taking some, some classes in unrelated fields and sort of like intellectually freed myself a bit and then started doing consulting for um, insurance firms and also for some investors that were thinking about insurance a little bit differently. Um, and one of my clients was Jay Grayson, who was the, at that point we had just started Surround Insurance, had a cool idea and some nice PowerPoints. Um, and yeah, about two months into my consulting for him, he said to me, have you, have you ever thought about starting an insure tech? And I said, no. And he said, no, I no. do you want to start, start, do you want to start this insure tech with me? Um, and so I got to tell you, so this is the cornfield story, which I'll keep short, but, um, I said to him, well, I have two issues. One of which is that you and I scarcely know each other. We were actually formerly former colleagues at Liberty Mutual, but we'd literally never met despite having been at many of the same executive mm -hmm. meetings. It was sort of weird. Um, and also I wanna to talk to some regulators first because I wanna make sure that our new approach is something that's gonna pass muster. Otherwise we're gonna do a whole bunch of work. We're not gonna get anywhere. And he was like, okay, well, how do we visit regulators? And I was like, well, 
why don't we start East Coast and then Midwest? And he was like, great, so we're going to Chicago. I was like, oh no, <laughs> we're going to Springfield <laughs> and, and places since. And so I, I said to my husband before I went on that trip, I was like, so one of two things is gonna happen. Either I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna tell you I wanna start an insure tech or I'm gonna call you from the side of the road in Peoria because I can't find an Uber to take me back to the airport after Jay throws me out of the rental car, you know? Um, but no, we went and we had some great meetings with a bunch of different regulators who were very encouraging of what we had to say. And it turns out that long, long car trips with people you scarcely know are good ways to get to meet them. I, you know, after about hour four, I ran out of every story about my daughter and then I kept talking <laughs> and eventually we got to the cool insurance stuff. So that's literally how I came to be co-founder at Saran. That was. Uh, I guess almost two years ago now. And now we're like on the precipice of finally entering the market here in Massachusetts. So it's been a journey. Yeah. And for those that are listening, it takes that long. Like it does. It that's does. part does. of the problem that I hope that I hope mm -hmm. that we can solve at some point. Maybe we'll team up and do that. But <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, like even now it took two years for you uh, to sort of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. get to get to that particular point. But before we yeah jump too far in how about uh discussing yeah. um why 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 does surround need to exist yeah. what's what's the yeah. what's the cool what, what makes you different what's the cool new thing that you know the incumbent insurers can't already offer yep yep good question <laughs> we get that question from investors a lot who are like well can't incumbents do that i'm like well do you see them doing it um so so here's the thing so i'm going to go back to that fairness thing right so one of the things in my career that has really been an area of interest for me is how do you serve underserved populations and there are a lot of populations that are underserved by insurance and others that are over served unfortunately um but one of them is sort of young adults right so Insurance used to be the kind of thing where you, it, it kind of tracked that traditional American lifestyle, right? You graduated from college, you finished your military service, or, you know, you finished high school, you bought a car because you were now independent and you went to your parents' insurance agent, you bought car insurance, that was your first purchase, right? A little while later, you decided to get married, you bought a home, you bought homeowner's insurance. A few years later, you had a baby, you got life insurance to go with it. So there was this traditional trajectory to people's lives. Um, and the insurance products were really mostly about things. We'll put the life insurance aside for a moment, but you know, the car, the home, the engagement ring, maybe whatever else, they were all about things. Um, and there's this, you know, enormous population of people who are living in a world where they're not, they don't want to buy those assets anymore. At least they don't buy them as early as they used to, right? So you've got people who are car sharing as a way of getting around the city. They've got zip car memberships, whatever else, instead of owning a vehicle. Um, yeah, they rent apartments for much longer. Home ownership has been delayed um, for economic and cultural reasons, both, right? They put off marriage and that puts off some of the, the decisions that might've been part of that traditional lifestyle as well, but they're still exposed to risk, right? Like what happens when you borrow your roommate's car and you're not sure if he or she has insurance and you get in an accident on your way to Ikea, right? Like they're coming after you, like maybe your roommate, but also you. You're the driver, yeah. and that liability is outrageous, right? There's no real yeah, it, can, it, can, so, it can ruin your it can ruin your life, your whole life, your whole yeah. life. Like aside from like your life and the people you love, the most important thing you have is actually probably your future earnings, and you, you, that's you, worth a lot more when you're 20 than when you're 50, right? Right, you're 20, you unfortunately kill a family in a caravan, right, and you can't dig out of that. You know, like even if you no. don't go to jail. You financially can't no, dig out yes. of that. No, no, you can't. And so then you say, well, as an industry, our, our job is to give people the tools to protect themselves in those situations. But like, what tools do we give them? Go, go try to buy a non-owned auto policy right now. How many phone calls does it take and how much time does it take to find somebody who won't sell you one? And not for I, any I, reason, just because it's not interesting to big carriers. Well, right? I'm, I'm an insurance professional. I, I honestly, I wouldn't know how to. I'd have to ask someone like you. Where it, I'd have to go to the insurance nerd Slack channel. Like, hey, where do I find? I wouldn't even know. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that. And then like, here's, here's a, a really scary one. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say to me, oh, well, you know, I don't drive. Well, actually I do rent a car sometimes when I'm on vacation. You know, sometimes I, I'm the driver with all my friends because I've done a lot more driving. My credit card will cover my rental car insurance. 
And I'm kind of like, ooh, some do, some do, but yeah. many of them only cover the damage to the vehicle. And the damage to the vehicle is limited to, well, the price of the vehicle, right? And you're probably not driving a Ferrari on your vehicle. Whene- probably not, right? Whenever I'm yeah. at a rental desk, I always have um, Bill Wilson's voice kind of coming <laughs> from behind where he's just like, he's like, will the, will the platinum card cover it? It might. And so, Bill, what do you do? I buy the insurance. Like, he's, I just, exactly. even he doesn't exactly. know if it's going to cover no. it or not. No, no. And if you don't have car insurance of your own, that lie, again, it's a liability, right? And you're driving in an unfamiliar place, probably like, yeah. So that's all of these are scary. And then if you start reading, like, like we do, the, um, the releases that some of these services, like, you know, the, the bike shares and the scooter shares and the car shares, you read the releases, like they're not picking up any liability, and most of the car share services, many of them, um, when you're driving, you know, the ones where you're driving, I'm not talking about being an, an Uber passenger. Mm-hmm. Um, if they, they, they generally do have to include some insurance, but it's usually at state minimums. So in some states, that's as low as $10,000 of liability. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sorry, but if you hit somebody, you're in. Oh, no, whoa. that doesn't even cover like a few hours of lawyer time. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Wait until you see the ambulance bill, right? I mean, yeah, so so you asked why does surround exist need to exist, and this is why it needs to exist. Like the world just just isn't defined by prop kinds of property anymore, but insurance is. And what legacy carriers can't do is reach across that and say, "How can I fit my product to people's lifestyles?" Right, and some of it is siloed thinking and siloed training, and some of it is like legit old ecosystems of like auto insurance where you got like 150 yep. systems attached to each other and replacing one means COBOL someplace else. And so maybe you don't even know who has an auto and a home policy with you. Forget about life and like, ha, you thought you were going to figure out if they were a business customer as well. Forget it, right? So that piece of like cutting things the other way and not looking at them on the basis of a court case from 1930, but like, you know, looking at them, how people live their lives, like how can you be compliant within the regulations, which do exist to protect customers, right? And still design a product that meets people's needs. That's where the industry is missing right now. And that's what we're building. Okay. So basically it boils down to fairness. Got it. Which yes, is, life is unfair, Nick. I'm it is. Oh, well, I know. I know. <laughs> um, it just, it's so the things that you sort of touch on are kind of things mm-hmm. I hammer home which is even in a mature insurance market like the United States or like the UK, yeah. some other areas of the world, yeah. I, my guess is that there are probably more exposures that are uninsured or underinsured yes. that are actually insured. Like we, we are actually on unsafe ground. We're on quicksand yes. when it yes. comes to insurance. Like we, oh, I got my auto covered. Or I got yeah. my homeowners covered, but it's, you know, I go to the rental counter at the airport. I have to buy insurance because I'm not sure. And I really don't want to put my family at risk. And that happens all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is my, is my computer, you know, all of these people who are now working from home, my computer equipment covered partially, you know, and they're all there. It's, it's, um, that's one of the things where the incumbents, I think struggle as well is that Mm -hmm. the, their products themselves don't go take you over the finish line. They're fuzzy gray areas all over the place where they don't provide full coverage. And it's really not fair to the consumer because they're just at a complete disadvantage, right? They, they don't read the policies. They have to um, rely on agents and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but if the agents don't understand either, and I think bulk of them are also in a gray area, Mm -hmm. what are, what are we to do? Right. You know? And so I think, there's a, a definitive need for companies like Surround to come in and kind of uh, make make the fuzzy area less fuzzy. Yeah, and I think- Did I, I describe I like that correctly? That. Yeah, I, I like that. It's make the fuzzy area less fuzzy. And then it's also like defuzz for people who just don't fit the traditional insurance yeah. generally, right? Like, because for, for those folks, it's even patchier. Like, yes, there are, there are gaps that are critical and crucial um, for people who fit that more slightly more traditional molds, but my goodness, if you don't fit the way we've defined auto and the way we've defined property, you're out of luck, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. So surround gets started, and so mm-hmm. let's let's uh, walk through. We'll rewind the tape and kind of walk through. Yeah. 
you're starting yeah. to think of like, okay, this is who we are, right? Yes. Now we have to build something, do something. What do you build? What do you do? What do you, how are you, how are you guys processing <laughs> through? Because I want to give everybody a flavor of, there's a lot of Venn diagrams that you're kind of throwing yes. on this. This isn't about picking the first thing that's fuzzy or the first thing that has, uh-uh. is warm to your heart. You're no. also going to be, you know, either raising money or having stakeholders yep. who are going to expect mm-hmm. that you're going to deliver something to them. So part of that Venn yes. diagram you have to throw over is, you know, we want something where there's some relevancy, you know, uh, yes. uh, a, a TAM, uh, an addressable yes. market that's, a good enough size that makes it worthwhile for us to kind of kick yes. this off. Yes. So to walk, walk me through how you and Jay are thinking through this. Yes, absolutely. Um, so everybody says that going from zero to one in terms of, you know, selling your first whatever is the hardest part. And I actually think that's true, but I actually think going from like zero to point one is also kind of the hardest part because you're sitting there with a blank sheet of paper and you're like, well, shoot, we have this fancy PowerPoint. Now what? Right. Um, and so there were, there were a few things. So we're a managing general agency, um, just for people who might not be familiar. And so that means in terms of structure, we needed a few things. We needed funding, which you mentioned. Um, we needed systems and we need systems that basically work like a carrier's, right? Like we have a policy administration system like a carrier would. So it's, it's a fairly complex set of yeah, systems. Uh, let, yeah. me, let me just stop just for, yeah. for the audience sake, just, yeah. and, and I'll let you carry yeah, forth. So MGA, managing general agency, um, it's a, it, it, there are different terms for it, but you're essentially combining uh, several units. You're responsible for finding the business. Mm-hmm. You're responsible for underwriting the business yeah. and or some combination of you're responsible for the claims element. If yeah. for all intents and purposes, you are a carrier. You're just not a carrier. You're just, you're acting yeah. like a carrier. You have yeah. a relationship with a the carrier. Exactly. They're, they're trusting you with some element of a combination of those things. Continue. Exactly. It's it's a capital light way to set up where you transfer the actual insurance risk, but in many ways you function like a carrier. That's yep. absolutely right. Yeah. So you need the systems, you need yep, you system. need to know how the whole thing works like a hub oh, yeah. and spoke model. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yep. I mean, the only piece that would be different between this and building a carrier would be the licensing for a carrier as opposed to we're licensed yep. as an agency. Um, and then um, the amount of capital you need. You need a vast amount of capital to sell, a, to start a, a, a carrier. Correct. And then there's a the question of whether yep. it actually makes sense as an investment in terms of Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so we've got, um, we need systems, uh, we need investment and we need um, paper. So since we're not a carrier, we need somebody else's license to borrow basically an issuing carrier and reinsurance behind that. There are a few ways to structure that. That's how we structured it. So, you know, you got that. And then you've got the whole piece, which is like any startup is you got to spend time with customers and build the product they actually want on top of all this infrastructure, right? Yeah, there's so much going on. You're building, you're essentially building an insurance company, right? And then you you have to build the product too. Like almost every piece of it, you're, you're literally starting from scratch. Exactly. And it's kind of weird because it both has to work as a system, right? Like a a startup has to, like the decisions you make about what you're actually selling to consumers do drive some pieces of how you're going to set up the underlying system. But you also have this like insurance piece that you have to do regardless of whether you're selling drone insurance or a non-owned auto or, you know, massive, (laughs) some kind of massive flood flood insurance. Yeah. For for example, there's some really smart people working on flood insurance I've heard. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So, so what did we do? Um, so we raised some money. Um, you know, it, it turned out that our sweet spot was really with insurance people, right? Like many of the venture capitalists were sort of like, you need to be direct to consumer like lemonade. Um, you know, the direct to consumer thing is the bandwagon that a lot of people fell on. Obviously, um, lemonade had a, you know, a financially very successful IPO and all of that. Um, but trying to push a new insurance product through the direct-to-consumer channel when the cost of customer acquisition makes absolutely no sense to begin with, let alone for a product that you then have to teach people about, just didn't make any sense. So we also had a distribution piece that we had to add all of the, to all of this, right? Um, we are distributing through independent agents and we're really excited about that, but that's not something that like any straight-up venture capitalist who doesn't know insurance wants to- Yeah, want carve to them out. 
Yeah, exactly. You know how many times yeah. I heard that? Like, oh, there's, there's, there's too many pigs at the trough. You're right. I'm like, so <laughs> the one thing I do remember reading sometime back is if you disintermediate a channel, you still have to pay the costs of what those people were doing, right? And I'm kind of like, independent agents are a $350 billion channel of property and casualty insurance in the United States, and their share has held roughly steady over the last few years, right? Um, and many of them, the larger ones in particular, are incredibly digitally sophisticated. And we pay a flat commission rather than an uncertain cost of customer acquisition. And they have this burning need, right? Which is they used to have this intergenerational handover where you know their clients' children would age off the family auto insurance policy and then they would buy their next vehicle, you know, they'd buy their first vehicle and they'd come into the agent's office, right? Well, that purchase is gone, the burning platform yep. is gone. They don't want to compete with Geico. And uh, progressive, you know, 10 years later when like Junior finally buys a car, right? So we're like a starter pack plugging that need that they have, right? So like it just kind of works that way. But it meant that inv for investment, we were much better off with people who knew insurance. Our earliest investors were like retired C-level executives from big insurance companies. Um, now we have some insure tech funds on board and some very sophisticated sort of insurance type investors. So that was the investment piece. Not easy, right? Like raising money, like people talk about how easy it is. I think that's true if you're like already in Silicon Valley on your fifth startup, you know, other than that, like, yeah, hard, that's right? the only way, like, yeah. it, I, I actually was uh, talking to someone and we were talking about, uh, they were potentially there, there's conversations of being acquired and they're getting conflicting information. Do we get acquired? Yeah. And I said, you know, you're a young person that exit looks really good. You know, if you get a successful exit, you know, you can now use it. You can swing again. Yeah. Right. Like that's yeah. extremely powerful. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you. Like yeah. my, my experience raising money was that it was um, extremely time consuming. It was difficult Very. to focus on the actual building of the business because we were spending so much time yeah. Yeah. trying to raise capital. So those yeah. that do raise it easily, I think it, they fall under that category. Yeah. You know, yeah, um, almost entirely from what I what I can see, right? Mm -hmm. Which is also why we have so many tech people who are coming into insurance and they've got a very particular view of the world and there are problems that are accessible to them that are different from the problems that are accessible to insurance people, right? Yep. So there's that. So that's the investment piece. Then the longest pull in the tent is actually reinsurance and fronting. Like I, I know people like from outside the industry are like, what are you talking? Like, first of all, what are you talking about? Do those words mean anything, <laughs> right? But then second of all, like, how can that be? It's just a contract, right? Like, yeah, but it's a reinsurance treaty and, and a fronting agreement with massive multi-billion dollar carriers. And first you have to convince one or more that you're worth taking a risk on when actually it would, might be more profitable for them to go try to like get another piece of some large insurer's, you know, book, right? Yeah. And, and um, it's, the, it's yeah. the same level of work, right? As it raising is. raising your capital. It is so, so, so mm -hmm. and so, um, and, and, and that part is not one process. Like no. you, 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 you ended up settling on, you know, you, or you, or you end up settling on one or mm -hmm. a handful of reinsurers, one or yeah. a handful of yeah. fronting companies, but that yes. is the, the same level of effort as if you were raising capital, like you're almost yeah. having the exact same conversation, except yeah. they're going deeper into this product that you haven't built yet. <laughs> Last summer, um, we were negotiating with the reinsurer that we ended up going with, with a very large, highly, highly rated European reinsurer that we think the world of. But I, I ran the gauntlet, they, they would laugh at this. Too. I ran the gauntlet last summer where, um, you know, there was like their product, their product development team, their underwriters um, and their actuaries. And we actually have three products in our launch product. It's a non-owned auto or renters and a miscellaneous professional liability for a side gig, like three minutes to quote, super quick and easy. But it meant that there were like three teams at the reinsurer. Yeah. Right? So I'm getting bouncing back and forth between personal lines and commercial. And it's basically me, you know, because Jay was doing a lot of the fundraising and I was doing a, a lot of the, the reinsurance and the fronting. <laughs> and you have no, you like, have no choice. You have no, no choice, but, but to do it that way, because it mm -hmm. is, um, it's not prudent, right. For no. you to decide, like, you're going to get a lot of advice. Like you got to, Kate, you got to focus on one thing. Right. Yep. But the thing is like, that is so long into the sales cycle. So time consuming oh. to get mm -hmm. to that, that if that fails, you're dead. You're you can't get dead. that. So you have to start like, okay, well, how about three products? How about multiple reinsurers yeah. that we have to talk to? Because exactly. if one backs out, exactly. then we're, we're dead. You know, exactly. we exactly. went through the exact same thing. And so yeah. it's, 
it's actually, I think it's easier to raise capital than to. You can do it in little chunks at least. This part is so complex and you have to have yours. There are the layers that you just described. Not only did you have to talk to multiple reinsurers, but mm -hmm. you had to go through various teams to discuss different products exactly. and how you were going to structure those. Exactly. So it was exactly. conversation. It was a, it's a Russian doll. It is. And then you're trying to do something that's a little bit different. And, you know, the secret sauce in what we built is that we can swap in and out tiny bits of insurance that fit through the regulatory and the reinsurance in the back end just mm -hmm. fine. Um, but you can, we basically pull them together in a beautiful digital front end. And we have the ability to do that in our platform with many kinds of insurance, not just the launch ones, right? But you're, you're doing this. And so you're, because it's new, you're also talking to actuaries where you're like, well, so there really is no loss data that's available on this. And we have no loss history, but you know, I've got these examples of competitors who are kind of quoting some piece of this sort of the same, but not really. So here's like 10 spreadsheets that explains that, right? And, and I mean, you know, we picked a market that it, uh, a market that is underserved and therefore not competitive in the way that like, you know, um, owned auto is, right? Which is like the most competitive insurance market. So, so there's some room to experiment and try to get it right. You don't need, you actually don't need super sophisticated rating when there's nobody else going after a market, right? So you can collect the data and then fix your pricing and then you've got yep. something yep. super sophisticated. But those are just, they're way more complex conversations than they would be if you're at a carrier where you were like, here's 10 years of our personal auto data. Let's argue whether the trend is like, you know, 1% increase in, in losses or a 2% increase, right? Like you're really creating it from scratch. So, you know, without a lot of support. So that, yeah, that reinsurance and fronting piece, like we ended up with partners that we are so excited to work with. Like, like it's, it's kind of unbelievable that they're working with us, right? For us, we're, we're so grateful and, and excited to work with them. They have the capacity on both sides to sort of support us for a long, long time to come, right? These are, these are going to be longstanding relationships, but gosh, getting there so hard, like the funnel is broad, um, the time frames are very, very long. It's a very complex process. Yeah, that's actually the long pole in the tent. And then the third part was sort of the actual product itself and the systems. That was a lot of interviews with customers, with agents, with the parents of young consumers because they pay the bills for a pretty significant portion of young adults. Um, and then you're sort of like just building, rinsing and repeating. And I, I have to admit that part was really fun and exciting, right? Because as a product manager, I've been, mm -hmm. I've been used to dealing with very old systems, sometimes it's like COBOL still under the hood. And so in this case, you know, we've got like a policy administration system that's all in the cloud and it's low, low code and we can configure it for any kind of insurance, not just like, you know, it's like one auto ecosystem or whatever. And we've got our own platform on top of that and everything's in AWS and it's just like such a luxury. Like you're so free of some of the constraints that, that you just can't avoid dealing with when you're on the carrier side. Yeah. And so what's interesting is for like the tech folks that are listening that come into this space. <laughs> you can't you can't bring in like a real strict uh, adherence to like agile development or mm -mm. you know the lean startup minimum viable product it doesn't exist you can't no. do it no. like your the minimum viable product is an exquisite piece of work like if you if you can't get the paper you can't issue a policy yeah you can't get the reinsurer you can't get the paper <laughs> Right. If you can't get enough money to build enough out that the reinsurer believes that you actually can do the work, then you can't do any of yeah. this. And if you don't know what statutory reporting is, you haven't done enough research, you know, <laughs> like. And, and we, on my side, we talk about that all the time. And, and, and I would say that, like, I think like a lot of our relationship going forward is going to be talking about that, the minimum viable product, like agile development and insurance, because I, I think that's what, Mm -hmm. To me, when I see what Surround is doing, it's like, that's mm -hmm. what excites me the most mm -hmm. is um, your ability to potentially roll uh, or, or spin something up mm -hmm. probably faster mm -hmm. than like what anyone else is going to be able to do. So new, but new product, mm -hmm. new market, right? And yes. the way you're thinking about it is really clever, I think. Yeah. And I think that's what excites me the most because I... I, I have full I have full respect for like the way you and Jay sort of thought about like your initial products, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking more of an, an abstract thing. Like yes. I think yes. I think what's the the product that Surround has brought to the table is this potential solution to the MVP. Like how you can just said we it get better than 
how can yes. we get a product to market <laughs> faster that? than what others are doing? Yes. And uh, others are, yes. have tried to attempt this. I've seen yes. how they've done it. Yes. And, yes. and, and I'm hats off, like, cause yes. even we've tried to do that in this way, Hard. but surround has been one of the first and, and listen in the comment section, you can yell at me all you want. Maybe there are others. I'm not exposed to all of them, but yes. this is the one that I've, I sort of laser beamed on is just like, you guys have connected a yeah. lot of the dots here, which yeah. makes it very exciting. Yeah, so I'm going to go like really big now, right? Like we talked about this particular underserved market, but that's not really what we're building. That's the first thing we're building. Yeah. What we actually built is a platform that lets us create personalized insurance subscriptions for the 100 million people in the US who buy more insurance than is legally, uh, legally mandated, right? Because what we've built is this ability to like create some on our own, you know, MGA platform. We can also take in products that our partners have built and redistribute them and wrap them all into the same bundle. And no insurer cares, I mean, no, uh, no customer cares that you've taken like 17 different bits and pieces and put them mm -hmm. together, right? Yep. So long as they're the right pieces, like they don't care at all. That, that's also why fundamentally the approach of like, oh, I'm going to write one insurance policy for all the exposures in somebody's life. Like, like it's just a waste of time. <laughs> it typically comes from non-insurance people who think that's the solution and it's not, right? You can, you can fight the regulatory regime all you want, but like, well, why bother when you can actually work within it and make all of this work, right? So yeah, like, you know, we're, we're thinking, we're already thinking ahead to like, what are products four and five? Because I don't know if this combination of three products is the right start. We believe it is, the research supports it, but who knows, right? It might be that pet is the right fourth thing. It could be that a light disability product, like a catastrophic disability, which never been, has never been sold on its own before because it's so inexpensive, it doesn't actually make sense. We're just like, yeah. 30, but yeah. gosh, what a great product, right? Like if you're totally and catastrophically disabled at the age of 30, like, gosh, you'd love that coverage. I, I don't. I don't, I don't think people like it, it, even insurance professionals, I don't think they have grasped like how important that is. So I'll, I'll give an example from my side. Yeah. Um, 90% of property owners in the U S have no flood coverage, commercial oh. and residential 90%. Oh. Oh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, like, and so yeah, I, the mission that we have and the mission that like I've, I've kind of um, that we've talked to investors and gotten yeah. our reinsurers to buy into is that our goal, our, our immediate goal, our near-term goal, because we're already selling flood, yeah. but yeah. it's not adequate enough. Like no. there is no product for that 90%. Right. Everyone we talk to will say, oh, well, you know, they can go to the government product or they mm -hmm. can, there's private writers. It's like, but these are low to very low risk people. They will never buy right. it because right. the minimums right. are too high. So the it's overhead, right. the overhead right. to run this is right. too burdensome right. to create a product. Our goal is to create a hundred dollar product. Like we Fantastic. have to, we have to drive towards that. And it, it takes a while, Kate, but when it, when it finally, when someone finally connects the dots, they're like, Oh, Whoa, that means you would be able to sell to the whole 90%. Exactly. Yes. Like and, they don't have a, they don't have right, a product. Right, right. Right. And like your, your customer base and, yeah. and this hundred million, like, I don't think people have connected the dots. Everyone's just like, well, there's auto insurance and they're no, no, you don't understand. Oh. They don't yeah. literally have products that right. will solve their problem. Right. No right. one has addressed Right. Them. And then when you say like, you probably have heard the same thing, like, oh, well, they don't buy flood insurance. So they won't. And you're like, well, when you're selling them a product that has a you know minimum premium of five hundred and twenty five dollars or something like what? I'm not going to buy it. Buy it if I were yes. like you know living where I live now. I'm not in a floodplain. But I just finished my continuing education for my producer license for flood. I remember. I don't remember the numbers. You would know. But an enormous percentage of of flood damage does occur in areas that are not floodplains. Right. It's exactly. on average, it's not a lot of damage per person. But man, if that's your house, it's like catastrophic. Right. A lot exactly. of people would pay hundred dollars a year to not worry about that, right? That would be a small chunk on top of my homeowner's insurance, you know, five hundred. Not everybody, but, and the goal is not to get the 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 goal. The immediate no. goal is not to get to get the ninety percent to buy. The goal is to get the number no. from ten percent to twenty to thirty to forty, and then exactly. to revolutionary uh, revolutionize the product that they currently have to just say, well, you can't buy this product without flood. That's exactly. the goal. Then we got a hundred percent. Now exactly. everybody has it because the start stop element of, you know, why, you know, the question, why, well, why haven't carriers done this? Why would they? 
they, they're not going to add flood to their product because they, they don't want to jeopardize what they currently have. It's what you said. It's easier yeah. for them to invest in lowering the loss ratio on right. the book they currently have right. than to try to build something new. So they won't yeah. do it. And it may even be the right thing for them to do, at least in the short term. I don't know, right? We got to see why, how, how that all plays out over time. But certainly they have a difficult decision to make that startups don't, right? And the other thing is too, like, I hate that, like, well, what if nobody will buy? Well, yeah, that, obviously if you're building something, nobody's going to buy you have a problem, right? But you do a lot of research around that. But also as a startup, if you guys got 2% of those like 90% of people who don't buy flood to buy your product, you would be fantastically massive. successful, right? Massively successful because well, it's a massive, massive market, right? And so, so. I, if we can spend a few times, so I don't, I don't want to yeah. take you past the um, yeah. time allotted yeah. um, that I gave you. Um, Cause you, your background is product development, product. Yeah. Product management and yeah. product development in insurance, yep. um, which has been, when I think of product development insurance, I, I, in my mind, I've always been thinking of like, wow, what a boring job, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, you're going to make another homeowner's product. Like, you know, what, what kind of bell and whistle can you add to that? Yeah. But you, yeah. I think we're simpatico and we're a little bit different in how we think of yeah. product design. There's, again, there's a lot of Venn diagrams that you're kind of throwing mm-hmm. off and you, you, your whole, the, what you just said of yeah. there, what if nobody buys it? Right. Yeah. Like that puts, that puts a lot of strain on you. Right. There's a lot of pressure yes. mm-hmm. on you to design mm-hmm. something that they're going to buy. And I always feel like, yes. well, uh, I'm I'm up for the challenge of doing that. But we yes. need to we need to yes. kind of get that started. So can you yes. maybe talk a little bit about designing a product that doesn't exist? Mm-hmm. So there is there is no there is no distribution for it because nobody is no. selling it. You don't know no. if. You, you think someone would buy it, but you don't know if somebody would. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that? Because to me, if that's the nut that we have to crack. We can't, yeah, if we can't sure. find new premium, then it's, I'm creating a product where I'm going to steal some of your business. And then three years, you're going to steal some of mine. And we yeah. just kind of swap back and forth. And Which who wants to do that? what the market actually is today, yeah, right? Exactly. That's what the so the, home, the homeowner's yeah. market today is, um, you know, a new company comes in, they create something new, they get a buzz, yep. they, they might, they might buy some business by charging cheaper, yep. they get a portfolio, and then someone else says, well, I want a piece of that. So then, then it's a race to yes. the bottom, and they're just swapping yes. business back and forth. You yes. created something new. How yes. talk about talk about how you did that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you two answers. The first, I'm going to talk about customers. And the second, don't let me forget to talk about regulations, okay? okay. Because that's yep. the part that I think people over people with a traditional product management background outside of insurance overlook. Um, so customers. So we talked to customers. And you can't ask them, like, what insurance doesn't exist that you want to buy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want None. to buy insurance, like, ever. Zero. I don't want to buy what any of it. About? <laughs> right. But if you go to a bunch of your target customers and you ask them questions like, what are you worried about? You know, like when or like, you know, and then they, they give you some stuff or you say, so do you have student loans? Like, do you worry about those? How do those influence your life? Do you ride a bike in the city? What do you worry about? Would you do anything different in a perfect world where you could create like the biking city of your dreams? You know? can, mm-hmm. Was any of your questioning in your um, your marketing effort there, your marketing research, was there any leading the witness? Did you, did you have a, 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 mm-hmm. a perhaps an inkling of a goal yes. that you were, you were thinking yeah. of getting, okay, go, yeah. go ahead then. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. We had a, we had some hypotheses um, from just like talking to people in our lives and what they were concerned okay. about. Um, like we, we had talked to some people early on who were we're like, oh gosh, when I rent a car, I always buy all the insurance because I have no idea what's covered, right? And we also talked to some people who had like kind of to me strange stories, like um, you know, I have these massive private student loans. They're absolutely crushing. And my biggest worry because they're private loans and my parents co-sign them is that I die in a car accident, my parents get stuck with my loans. And so I have term life insurance to cover my student loans, which like what. Like in some ways, how incredibly resourceful and responsible, right? And the yeah, but world, like strange as a possible? use case, yeah. Right, like the strangest use case yeah. for life insurance ever. 
Um, like, why doesn't that product exist, right? Um, and then similarly around the driving, like we, we were hearing a lot of people who were like, oh, I try to avoid driving. Oh, I wait until my friend goes to Ikea so I can like share a ride. Oh, I think Zipcar includes plenty of insurance, don't they? They must have to, right? Stuff like that, that was just like a little, you know, so we had some hypotheses. We did some sort of like straight up ethnographic, like tell us about what you worry about, tell us about risk, tell us about how you, you sort of protect yourself mm -hmm. when you're out and about in the world. And then we had some hypotheses that like people worry about driving, people worry about getting doored on a bike, people worry about their parents having to pay something off for them, that sort of thing. And, and notice, notice how mm -hmm. um, the pressure points mm -hmm. really affected their lives. Like how yeah. much they re they rearranged yeah. things yeah. to to yeah. kind of dance around yes. risk. Yes, yes. It's like in the insurance space, we have this this really not very respectful opinion of younger people, which is that oh they don't manage risk, they think they're going to live forever, and that's kind of true, but it's really kind of not right. Like what we actually found was that they had very sophisticated strategies for risk management in their lives, right? Like we wouldn't expect you know we we give large commercial customers the benefit of the doubt. Oh, well, they are mitigating some risks and transferring others to insurers, right? And, you know, the whole list of-, yeah. of But you, kind of you found young, young, young people are out. too. Young people are too, they that's are what too. you found. It's just different, right? They don't have the insurance to, to buy. It literally doesn't exist for a lot of the things they're doing. And so they bike on these long routes around how, you know, what the most effective way to go would be because the streets are less busy and they wait for somebody else to drive a car and they buy all of the insurance or they assume the insurance is included or they just worry, right? Like these are actually sophisticated behaviors. Like we can't write this off disrespectfully, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it was listening to that. Like nobody's going to be like, what I really want is a miscellaneous professional liability product at $100,000 of liability. Like that's like not a thing, right? But when you listen for the needs, you can build to them. So that's, that's how we did that. I want to flip to the other side though, because like the customer research is what everybody talks about when you when you go to build a product. And I mean, it's like a critical piece of the product management discipline, obviously, right? From from ethnographic research all the way through to like wireframes, the high fidelity, um, you know, systems and whatever else. All that is great. There are lots of books on that. Here's the piece in insurance that my entire career has been like a source of making changes that made a difference for me. And it is to actually understand the environment you're playing in, right? So read the regulations, all of them. <laughs> read the statutes, the laws. That's not actually the same as the regulations, right? Read some of the court cases. Um, read the actual policy documents that you know ISO and some of these other bodies put out as well as, as well as your actual customers. And then with all of that knowledge and information, ask yourself, are things being done a certain way in the industry because they need to be done that way? Or are they being done that way because a vendor built a system in 1960 that, that all these carriers used. And so therefore everybody learned it had to be a certain way. And now everybody believes it's a certain way. And it is amazing how frequently the latter is actually the case. All the time. Right? All the time. All the time. There's so much more freedom to do things than like the regulate. I don't have like a pro versus con for regulation. I mean, regulations are they do protect the consumer. Sometimes they can they can restrain trade to too great an extent. It depends on how they're applied and whatever else. What they do allow is the little guys like us to get in to a market that could well be winner take all, you know, good for the monopolies if they didn't exist, right? So you might as well read them and use them to your advantage. They're not a disadvantage, they're an advantage, right? So like really knowing that space and then mixing that with the customer need was really the right way to go. Yeah, I, I interviewed Lisa Miller, who's a former regulator in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I termed it like um, a cup of coffee with a regulator or something. And that was her thing. She's just like, oh, oh no, it was regulators or people too. <laughs> Which is right? true, right? Because you she's totally just like, because <laughs> in the conversation we were talking yeah. about how can insurance professionals interact with regulators to have more effective outcomes yes. and she's like take a regulator out for coffee seriously like it's, like, it's not that hard Call, right, right? And, and and until I had started this my experience with regulators always dealt with you know whatever legacy company I was working with yeah. saying do don't give them anything more than they asked for yeah. Right. And it was like, oh, my God, like, this, you them. know, this, we questions. can't. Yeah, we can't get this through because of the regulators. Yeah. And like, I don't, have don't I'm nearly 100 percent, 180 for 80 degrees on the other side 
where it's just like, I've now seen use case after use case where mm -hmm. uh, someone that didn't have that bias yeah. with the regulator yeah. was able to say, okay, Mr. or Mrs. Regulator, what, yeah. what do you need from me to right. satisfy? Right. Okay, I'll go get right. it. Right. And, and then the I, kind of thing where you're just like, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to serve an underserved market. Can you, I can read your, your objections, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to respond to them within the filing, but like, can you help me understand if there's a different way that is compliant with regulations that I could do this? And it's amazing how frequently they know the answer to that. And they'll just tell you, right? Because, because to them, think about the other side. They like don't get the information they need. They've got people like calling them up. Like, have you looked at my filing? Have you looked at my filing? And they get these rigid things from the companies that are like, we intend to do this, right? And it doesn't need to be that way. I'm, I'm not saying that it's always easy to work yeah. with the regulators and not every department of insurance is, is as helpful as others, but many of them are actually just totally human trying to do the right thing. Nobody becomes a regulator because they're not trying to do the right thing for the customers in the state, right? And hopefully as like an ethical business person, you're trying to do the same thing, right? So yeah. figure out how to do it together. Yeah. And, and in some ways it's similar to how you would have a business relationship with any other stakeholder. It's like, what can I do to make your life easier? Exactly, exactly. And what can I do? There's like a piece of it that's like, what can I do to show that I'm a human too? And that this matters to me a lot and that I'm doing it for really good reasons. And how can we build a little bit of a relationship around that? Because I understand yeah. you too. You literally come to work to serve the public good, right? Yeah. That's your job. Like, yeah, exactly. So how can we do this together, right? So, yeah. Uh, I, I want to I end with um, yeah. it, potential branding issues, right? So yeah. Surround is going to um, come out, right? And mm -hmm. you're going to have your first three products. Um, I have found this in my personal experience where all of a sudden it's like, oh, Nick's company, they do flood. It's like, yes, that was the first product. And we strategically yes. came out with that for a reason. But yes. We don't see ourselves as that. We're a tech company where, you know, we use technology to uh, deliver complex capacity down to yeah. the masses. That's yeah. make it as economical as possible. Yeah. Close that protection gap. That's our job. How, what, and you said that, you know, we had that in the middle part of our conversation um, where I think, I think I kind of nailed what your business model is, right? Like yeah, you, you totally see, did. you have this audience and your job is to spin up the appropriate risk transfer solutions mm -hmm. for them. And you've built a technological backbone yeah. that will enable you to kind of take that two years and kind of yeah. shrink it down to something yeah. much more mm -hmm. manageable. So um, you've just started. So I know you don't necessarily yeah. have an answer, but how do you avoid the trap of being branded into, oh, that's the surround. That's the company that does um, hired and non-owned for teenagers. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And suddenly you're, you're non-standard with the best of them. Right. Um, yes. Which again, we shouldn't be using the word non-standard for yeah. people, but you know, yeah. whatever, all of us are non-standard, right. Yeah. In our ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, haven't, you haven't seen me drive. I'm very non-standard. <laughs> like, well, I'll just stay away. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's that's a good question. So it's interesting because the people that we are positioning to first are the independent agents we're working with, right? We got something like 40 or 50 storefronts in Massachusetts. These are larger independent agencies, very preferred shops. Um, and what they needed from us as we got closer to market and they were really ready to dig in that we had some that helped us develop the product itself, but like really dig into the infrastructure of how we connect to the agents. Um, what became clear was what they wanted was support with digital tools, generally speaking. So our positioning actually, yes, you nailed it with all the product stuff, but the way we're talking to people is, is that we provide the digital tools that independent agencies need to reach modern consumers, right? So we've got like a whole bunch of different like UI front end ways you can connect from your social media, from your website, from ours, you know, a more traditional quote process, all of those, they're all slick and easy to use and beautiful. And we catch all the, you know, the analytics on the back end and stuff. So that's our first positioning. Um, you know, obviously we're really new. We're hoping not to get locked too tightly into a product piece because pretty quickly we're going to roll out some additional uh, like products into that bundle that are that you can then kind of customize a little bit without making it too confusing. But sort of we'll see. Like you're you're right. It's 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 but, hard. But that that means I think yeah. it it follows that um, even though you have a lot of stakeholders, essentially mm -hmm. the agent broker channel they are your customer. They absolutely they are. are. They, they are absolutely. the first customer. Yes, yes, there are customers behind them, but yes. 
that's the one just like on my side Mm -hmm. i i Mm -hmm. view um even we sell to to we sell through the agent broker system as well Mm -hmm. but i kind of view i lean towards my reinsurers or my customers like my job is to deliver the capacity down Yes. Yours, yours is the other way, the other way but it's around. still, but mm-hmm. it's still, that's the mm-hmm. forward facing the first one. Like yeah. if we, if we don't get them on our side, this isn't going to work. It is not going to work at all. Right. So what do they need and how can we serve them? Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what it's about. Yeah, it is. What I keep coming back to is that this is, it just is a very complex landscape, right? Like the, the startup world generally can be complex, but when you add in the insurance piece of it, there's just a lot of complexity to manage, to manage right? Yeah. And so um, uh, I, I want to end with one more question yeah. that I've been asking my guests yeah. lately, but, but this is what it boils down to, it, to me is I, I think there's, um, I hope what everyone takes away from this is the way you've, in, in your special way, the way you've created like agile development yeah. in, in a particular channel and yeah. a particular product, yeah. I think that's yeah. the most exciting thing. Yeah. Like it, for, for, for the long-term sanity of society, you, you, it became clear as you were talking about teenagers who were kind of stepping out of the way of risk, like yeah. it, a func- a society becomes more resilient when there's a functional and a robust insurance system yes. and yes. it has to evolve. Like yes. that, that pride that you had at the beginning, that kind of, yes. I was losing my pride. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm getting yeah. it back because of people like you. So well, because what you're doing, right? Like, you know, you're literally it, taking care of people who don't have the tools to take care of themselves yeah. right now. Right. Like that's yeah. an honorable thing to do. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, one final question, I know we're yes. short on time is um, books. I've been asking books. people about books lately. Any books that you have found to be particularly influential and it could be personal life or business yeah. life and it could be more than one book. Yeah. Yeah. That is a really good question. Um, I just finished a book that I believe the title is, is um, oh, it's Luck and Skill, Skill and Luck uh, by a professor at Cornell, whose name is escaping me right now. I'm going to have to tell you. But it was basically about the contribution to your success that luck makes. Like almost everybody who's successful is uh, is also hardworking, but there are lots of hard Oh, is that uh, Michael Mobus, Mobison? No, no, no. Um, oh, Man, I'm of no help right now. I'm going to email you this afterwards. Um, but it was just a fantastic book because to me, it's sort of exactly. What'd you, what'd you say the name was? Mm, I think it was Risk and Luck, Risk and Chance. Ugh, I'm going to have to find it for you. Okay. Um, professor just retired from Cornell. Um, but it, it, to me, it was like the encapsulation of, of kind of um, like insurance, right? Like, you, you kind of said it, but like the system has to work because if we live in a society where people get punished for thing, punished severely and way out of proportion for things that are either not at all their fault or maybe are their fault, but you know, not, not, not done truly negligently or with bad intent, you have a system in which people don't take the risks that we need to take to grow as a culture exactly. and people in a society, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it, which, which means there's a, a lot of responsibility on people like you and me and those mm-hmm. that are listening. Mm-hmm. We, can't just, we can't just take our legacy thoughts, our legacy biases and kind of transport them into the future. Homeowners has to change, auto has to change. and in the right spot to be in is to be fle- to be flexible, to be we quick to on your toes. Yeah, we right? have to change. We can do better and we can be better. And that's what we yeah. need to do. Yeah. So Kate Terry, thank you so much because Surround Insurance is mm-hmm. one of those companies that's going to make insurance nimble. We're going to be on our toes and being able to respond quickly as we evolve as a, as a culture and society and as risk evolves as well mm-hmm. and how we interact with that. So Kate, um, you're one of the good ones. <laughs> so are you, best, Nick. <laughs> best of luck as you, you as so you roll much. out. Thank you so, so much. Uh, for Kate, my name is Nick Lamparelli. Um, be safe out there. Wear your mask yes. and just be good to one another. And so until next time, Kate, thank you. Thank you, Nick. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in I have a dream that one day on the red hills of God, sons 